to Menopause Taylor, also known as Menopause University. <laughs> this is where we approach menopause every which way. I teach you all the nitty gritty stuff you need to know in order to manage your menopause your way. And one of the most important things I teach you is the similarities and differences between everything from diseases to options for managing them. Currently, we're pursuing a unit on cancer in general. Now, when I say cancer in general, I mean the science of cancer itself rather than any specific kind of cancer in any specific part of your body. And one of the most basic things about cancer in general is that all cancers share certain common characteristics that qualify them as cancer. So that's what we'll discuss today. In the first three videos of this unit, I have covered the normal cell in video number 309, cell size and cell number in video number 310, and cell abnormalities that lead to cancer in video number 311. So this is video number 312, and it will help you understand what all cancers have in common. The good thing about these videos is that I can give you information that you won't find in my book in the same format, regardless of whether you have the first edition or the second edition. So instead of only discussing each cancer individually as I do in my book, here I can present cancer in general. So let's address the things that are common to all cancers. The word cancer comes from the Greek word for crab. And that's because a crab consists of a central body with extensions emanating in all directions, similar to the behavior of cancers. Cancers are typically named according to the part of your body where they originate. This is similar to our tendency to identify people by their country of origin. If you've ever lived abroad, people will identify you by your country of origin, the American lady, the Italian man, etc. Of course, there are some cancers that are named for the person who discovered them, and some are named for the specific cell type that causes them. But in general, it's the original location of the cancer that determines the name of the cancer. This tendency to name a cancer based on its anatomical origin is not unique to cancers. There are many other kinds of diseases that are named based on their location too. Another common feature of cancers is that they all consist of uncontrolled replication of previously normal cells. Notice that I said previously normal cells. So cancers are a result of a normal cell that transforms into a cancer cell. Ultimately, it's a result of normal cells that transform into cancer cells. Now this is something that cancer scientists had difficulty discovering and accepting for decades. And that's because nobody wanted to believe that cancers could arise from within our own bodies rather than being caused by something outside of our own bodies. They wanted cancer to be caused by a virus or a chemical, but horror upon horrors, not by our own bodies going awry. And that leads us to the next thing that all cancers have in common. Anytime there is a transformation, there has to be a stimulus to induce the transformation. So all cancers have a stimulus that induces the transformation. But while all cancers start as a result of some sort of stimulus, the precise stimulus that causes any cancer varies greatly. You know, for every feature that is common to all cancers, they all have subsets of that feature that are not common to all cancers. So, the stimulus that causes a normal cell to transform into a cancer cell can be any of the following. A genetic mutation, a virus, a chemical toxin, or even something that is traumatic to the cell. But in many 
cases, it's not just one stimulus. More often than not, one stimulus sets the stage for a cancer to develop, but then others contribute. So when people try to designate just one single cause, it's often inaccurate. But whatever the initial stimulus, it causes just one single cell to start dividing abnormally. And that one single cell then forms two cells, which form four cells, and so on. So all cancers are characterized by cells that divide abnormally over and over again, but they all begin with just that one single cell that starts dividing abnormally. And with time, those abnormal cells start dividing more rapidly than normal cells. But another common feature of all cancers is that they develop over a long period of time. Now this is something that people fail to realize. It is so common for people to blame the most recent thing they consider cause-worthy for their cancer, when more likely many things contributed. And you know what? If you stop and think about it, there is nothing logical about assuming that a cancer occurs in a short period of time. Think about how long it takes for you to get sick when you're exposed to a virus. It takes days to weeks for you to manifest signs of infection. Well, the process of cellular change that results in a cancer is a whole lot more complicated than the process involved with an infection from a virus. Most cancers take years to develop to the point that enables diagnosis. It is a huge fallacy that cancers pop up overnight. So, here's a depiction of the timeline of a cancer. First, we have the single microscopic cell that undergoes stimulation by something that transforms it into a cancer cell. And then, it causes that cell to double. And next, we have that same cell doubling over and over and over for years before there's any outward hint of cancer. Look at this, it goes through all these divisions and it's gonna take a long time for it to make its presence known in terms of symptoms or detectability on a screening test. So it keeps replicating for many, many, many years until it eventually becomes detectable only on an early screening test that can find it before you have any symptoms. And eventually, it reaches a size that is finally, ultimately, macroscopic. Way down here, it finally becomes macroscopic which means it can be seen with the naked eye on a screening test. But that takes years too. Look at this whole timeline. That is a long, long time. Notice that the times that I have next to this are one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, six years, seven years before it even becomes macroscopic. It doesn't become large enough to make its presence known for a long time, depending on the kind of cancer it is. The sequence of events could have started over a decade ago. That's actually the case for most cancers. So if you get a cancer diagnosis, don't focus on what happened recently as a cause for it. Think about what happened around 10 years ago. That's the stimulus that started the process. It's somewhat like this crab creeping out of a shell. It stays hidden for a very long time, and then it slowly creeps out 
so, so slowly, making its presence known very, very gradually. Another common feature of all cancers is that they destroy other tissues around them. Cancers are very rude. They do not respect boundaries. They care nothing about social distancing. So they just barge through barriers like the ones separating one organ from another. This is one of the hallmark features of cancers in general. But if a cancer is going to grow uncontrollably, how in the world does it get an adequate blood supply to support all that growth? Oh, well that brings us to the next common feature of all cancers. Another hallmark feature of cancers is that they recruit their own blood supply. Since they break all the rules of order, they can't count on the blood supply that is already present. So what do they do? They create their own. If they tried to support, to support themselves on the blood supply that was already there, they would not be able to invade so broadly. So the cancer just creates its own blood supply. It is determined to keep itself alive. And typically, the more aggressive the cancer, the more profound the blood supply. And yet another way in which a cancer keeps itself alive is by forming genetic mutations that enable it to resist things that would normally kill it. In other words, it enhances its own immunity. This is why cancers grow so persistently, spread so widely, and fail to respond to treatment so commonly. The rapidly dividing cancer cells outsmart whatever we use to try to kill them. It is very unnerving for cancer scientists and oncologists to discover that a cancer is quite literally outsmarting them. It's as if the cancer is always one step ahead in being able to resist being destroyed. And unlike most other diseases, cancers migrate. They find ways to travel throughout your body. Cancer cells use all sorts of means to mobilize. They hitchhike on blood cells or in lymph or on anything they can in order to travel. They actually journey from one location to another via some vehicle. They are gregarious. And once they arrive at a new site, they become squatters. They move in and decide to live there. In other words, they implant after they migrate. This is what a metastasis is. It's a cancer cell that has traveled from its original site where it has continued to thrive wherever it has ended. And the more it travels, the more it gains steam. Now, normal cells die spontaneously. They have a life cycle just like we do. So your normal cells are always replicating and dying in a controlled manner that keeps the cell population in balance. But cancer cells ignore all that, too. They refuse to die. They create mutations in order to ignore the signals for cell death. So cancer cell populations become overpopulated, growing persistently and uncontrollably. So here's a list of the common behaviors of all cancer cells. They identify by location of origin. They transform from previously normal cells. They begin in response to a stimulus. They start with one single cell that divides abnormally. They progress slowly. They destroy surrounding tissue. They create their own blood supply. They resist insults by enhancing their own immunity. They migrate to other locations via blood or lymph. And they implant in distant locations, which is called a metastasis. 
You know, we tend to think of cancer as a disease that spins out of control. I told you in the last video that cancer is all about disorganization. And, and that is definitely true if you look at the patterns of cancer cells. And it's definitely true if you're looking at it from the perspective of a human who is plagued by the cancer. But if you really study cancer, you'll discover that it is actually very controlled with regard to its own intentions. Cancer knows precisely what it intends to do. It intends to live at our body's expense by utilizing the very same processes that our bodies perform under normal circumstances. It's a smart parasite that lives and thrives at our expense. It does create disorganization of our plan, but the cancer itself has its own plan. And part of the plan is to re its havoc with disorganization. And there is nothing uncontrolled about it from the perspective of the cancer itself. Ultimately, it really qualifies as being a perfect example of an oxymoron. Organized chaos. The cancer is organized, but it throws our bodies into chaos. So this list of common cancer characteristics will form the basis for everything else you learn about cancer. And despite all these common characteristics, different cancers behave very differently. Even though they all meet the hallmark criteria for cancer, they have very different personalities. So that's what I'll address in the next video. If you need me for anything at all, I'm always available. You just go to menopausetaylor.me and schedule a consultation. But be sure to read all the details when you schedule. <laughs> Unlike cancers, <laughs> I am very organized. <laughs> I have rules and protocols, and they are all in place so that I can give you my best effort. And once you have a consultation with me, you'll realize how efficient it is. Other than that, you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and you can subscribe right now. Bye!